Hi everyone, you are listening to On The Margin. I am your host, Michael Ippolito, and today I'm going to be joined by Dan Tapiero, who is the co-founder and CEO at 10T Holdings. Dan has one of the most impressive pedigrees on any investor I have ever spoken to. He cut his teeth with Julian Robertson over at Tiger, but he's also worked with several of the other hedge fund greats that include Stan Druckenmiller and Steve Cohen. We go into a bunch of detail about that on this episode. We covered a lot of really interesting topics with Dan, ranging from his past investing experience to his view of the macro today, and then how that all led to the development of this new fund, 10T Holdings. If you're listening to us on Apple, please make sure to give this episode a rating and a review. Let us know what you thought. If you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, just push that subscribe button. All right, on to the show. All right, let's give it a go. So first things first, it's been a little while since we last caught up. How are things? Yeah, no, things are good. Uh, you know, have been very busy, uh, obviously, with 10T. Um, you know, the markets are, are all over the place, too. Well, I, I actually kind of want to start before we get into kind of today's macro landscape and what your opinions are. Uh, I'd love if we could actually start with your background a little bit, because you've worked with some of the biggest names in macro hedge funds kind of ever, right? From Stan Druckenmiller to Julian Robertson. And I, I heard you talk uh, about a particularly formative experience of yours uh, at Julian's shop uh, when you were kind of fresh out of college. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of leading off with what that experience was like working with a guy like Julian. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, that was formative for me because I was very young uh, early in my career and um, they gave me quite a lot of responsibility right away. Uh, funnily enough, I was hired, I guess, when you're 23 years old, um, you know, uh, coming in the office at 3 a.m. Uh, is not really a big deal. And it wasn't a big deal for me because, you know, during college, I'd stayed up. I don't know how many times to write you know, all night, do all nighters to write papers, uh, history papers. So it wasn't very difficult. And I was also an athlete. So um, physically, it didn't really bother me. But I was coming in at 3 a.m. to actually put on bond and currency positions in Europe. And this was in 92, 93. And I was, you know, really on the on the front line. Um, I had there were two senior partners, um, you know, who I worked for uh, and then Julian above them. And, um, you know, really was the, the focus of the fund at, at that time were these positions. And so I was given a lot of responsibility right away um, and was sort of at the forefront of, you know, I would say near historical trades. I mean, the first real currency trade I, I uh, ever did was the forced devaluation of the Irish punt. And we, I mean, sort of unknown, of course, but we were part of the pressure uh, that that broke that punt in '92 out of the uh, out of the RM mechanism, and I, I say broke, but it was really you know um, you know in a sense it was it was in the RM at a mispriced uh, at a mispriced level, and they ended up linking into the euro at what was a, a better price in the end for them. Um, so in a sense, we were just value investors, and we saw that there was you know, something that was a bit too expensive and that, um, you know, for the point to come in at a, uh, you know, at a more appropriate rate, you know, net net, I think benefited them. Um, but, you know, in those days, there were all kinds of crazy things going on. Uh, I remember it, we investing in Spanish bonds above 10 percent. Uh, we had big positions in Italian bonds and and also in swaptions at the time, uh, these were options on swaps, which at the time was pretty innovative, you know, cutting edge stuff. Um, the fund had made a lot of money in ja in Japan. The the Japanese portfolio had been built before I had uh, before I'd been at Tiger uh, again, and then we just applied the same rationale to the positions in Europe. I don't know if you recall. I mean, you probably don't, but in the early '90s, at that time, Germany was in the midst of its greatest recession since uh, the Second World War, um, you know, the integration with Eastern Germany um, cost them a fortune and things slowed down dramatically. And it made no sense that German interest rates, but also other rates in Europe were as high as they were. And so it was sort of a once in a, a lifetime opportunity. And many of the global macro guys in 92, 93 at the time had record years 
And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can see this if you look back all those years ago at the, at the performance and, and, the, and the money that was made by those investors. So, you know, as a 23 year old being on the front line, I mean, I, I, I cut my social activity to, to zero, basically. And I felt, you know, I had a, a pretty uh, big responsibility, you know, learning the process, uh, how to think about investments, watching Julian operate, and then also seeing, and I think what you're referring to is seeing the huge amount of risk that he was comfortable right. taking because he had that conviction level uh, is something, you know, that stays with you your whole life. And I've never seen anyone uh, take that much risk and, of course, be successful as Julian. I mean, maybe Stan, uh, you know, a, a little bit the same, but uh, not not quite what, you know, what, what I saw there. And, you know, once you see something like that and you're part of it and you live with it, uh, as I said, it, it's, uh, it, it stays with you forever. And so my own uh, macro investment, uh, I would say, a style and process is is similar only in the sense that I do look for very big structural changes, macro opportunities, and I tend to be very concentrated on those uh, specific opportunities. And so, you know, Stan used to say he he liked to put all his eggs in one basket and then watch that basket very carefully. Hmm. And you know, very often people don't understand this that it's a much lower risk strategy than diversifying across a whole bunch of things that you don't have as much conviction in. And so my process at the core of it is deep research. And I've always had sort of between four and eight research analysts at all times, um, because the only way you can get confidence in anything is just by doing more work and more digging. Yeah. So it's, I saw it's... that you know, in my early days, you know, it's kind of that old adage, right? You can copy someone else's trades, but you can't copy their conviction, or that's a lot harder. Um, and one of the, I, I heard, I listened to you talking to Raul Paul um, about your experience at Tiger in, in a recent interview, and you were describing how in the portfolio there'd be daily swings of 300 to $400 million. Um, sure. I mean, the fund was only, you know, three or four billion at the time, but uh, it wasn't, it didn't swing like that every day, and it usually swung like that positively. Uh, you know, it's a, that's bad. A big that's difference really better. If it's, yeah. <laughs> um, but I remember it because, you know, there were days where I would be sitting there, you know, at 5 a.m. and I would get a call from Julian and, you know, he would know that like the portfolio was getting crushed. And I remember, you know, I mean, tremendous fear as well, speaking to him on a day when, you know, you're trying to estimate you're down 300 million in the portfolio, I mean, it's a 10% drop. Now that would be, of course, from, you know, being up 20, 30% or whatever it was. I, I don't ever recall being down below zero, but it's still, you know, it's quite a stressful situation. You're there on the front line and, um, you know, there was no room for error. I mean, if you made a mistake in recounting the p &L or something about the portfolio to Julian, I mean, you could be a goner. Uh, I mean, there was no, you know, there was not a lot of, uh, leeway. So, you know, you had to be, you had to be pretty focused there, uh, you know, when speaking to Julian. And I know many people who were at Tiger and who've interacted with him. I mean, it's pretty much the same thing as the same experience people had. But you know what? Uh, that was also formative because, you know, you really, you really learned how to perform at the highest level that I think exists. So, I mean, I was terribly fortunate and very lucky to have been given that opportunity. Yeah. And uh, I mean, what you're saying kind of tallies with um, something that's been observed post uh, Tiger management, which is the Tiger Cubs, right? And, and a lot of people that started at Tiger go on to have very successful careers uh, like sure. yourself. Um, so, you know, just to sum up everything you kind of said there, one of the, the big takeaways for you working at a shop like that was just what it's like to kind of see that volatility firsthand, you know, very extreme volatility, uh, and but kind of ride that out um, by maintaining a high conviction. Well, let's transition a little bit to what you see in the macro environment today. Uh, so we're dealing with a, a pretty unusual, I would say, macro environment. Um, you have guys like Jeremy Grantham kind of calling this a historic uh, bubble uh, and kind of starting to raise flags there. The last time that we talked, you actually described the macro landscape as one of the most exciting 
you've ever seen in your entire time in investment management. I'm curious, yeah. why, why do you think that? Well, because there's a, there's a wholesale rethink, I think, about what the financial system could look like in five to 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that, and again, you know, I've been focused on Bitcoin and on companies in the digital asset ecosystem that are growing up with the adoption of Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, blockchain technology. And so, um, you know, you see sort of some of the most dynamic, most intelligent people, you know, let's say in their, in their 30s in this digital asset ecosystem space. Um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, the, the possibilities, the, um, you know, the white space, as they call it, uh, seems almost endless. And there's creativity, there are new, uh, you know, there, there are new um, creations, I guess you'd call it, in the space, you know, almost weekly. Um, and so, you know, there is a world and no one really is quite sure what it looks like. Um, but I think everyone has a pretty is pretty convinced that the world 10 years from now will be more digitized that um, that the rails of the financial system that we use today, uh, we will not use in the future. Uh, I mean, just look at um, uh, the SWIFT system. You know, the SWIFT is a pre internet technology. And so it doesn't make any sense to anybody that those are the rails that we're going to be using in the future. And so, you know, yeah, there were exciting macro opportunities uh, when I was at, you know, Tiger in the early 90s or later on, uh, you know, working with, you know, Michael Steinhardt or with Druck. There were lots of interesting macro opportunities, but they were all sort of within the old, uh, the existing framework, you know, um, the central bank eased, you were long bonds. You know, it wasn't, you know, the dollar valuation was way too strong, it was gonna go down. Uh, you know, Brazil was going to have a boom because, you know, soybean prices were gonna double, you know, currency appreciation. I mean, there were all sorts of traditional linkages, uh, which were very interesting. And I just think that that whole system is morphing into something new and different and we're not quite sure what it is so you know just imagine being sort of on the edge of all this innovation and change uh and, and no one really has the answer i think there's some companies that are going to be winners that have already in a sense won have established moats um you know those are companies that uh i'm investing in now um they're larger in size i think some people are quite shocked when they realize that, you know, there are 40 companies in the space that have a market valuation of over 400 million. Uh, you know, there are at least 20 that are over a billion. You know, I'm not sure what the valuation is of Coinbase. I know the market is saying it's 100 billion. But even if that's wrong, and even if it's 50 billion, I mean, that's still quite something enormous. Uh, and might, you know, be a wake up call for some people. Um, but so, I mean, that's sort of what I'm what I'm talking about. I don't have a, a definitive answer as to what it will look like. I just know for sure that it will look different. And I want to be invested in uh, the companies that are molding and shaping uh, building this new world. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how that new world would kind of interact with the old world. I've heard your description of Bitcoin as pristine collateral, which I want to get yeah. into um, later. The kind of topic du jour or the way that most people understand Bitcoin is kind of as uh, digital gold, right? So what you're seeing is large asset managers um, kind of incorporate gold or incorporate Bitcoin in their portfolio as a complement to gold or as a potential alternative to gold. Do you eventually see that as being the role for crypto or you're kind of describing an entirely new system? Yeah. So how, how do you see these two systems interacting with one another? Yeah, I mean, I think store of value and digital gold is it's sort of a nice buzzword. Yeah, there is some aspect to that because it's, you know, 21 million units. It's finite. So you have fiat, which is being inflated. Uh, the supply is being inflated uh, dramatically. And you have Bitcoin, on the other hand, where the supply is finite. So it's relatively common sense. Old school investors can get that. Um, they may not totally buy in, uh, you know, you have to do a, a lot of work, uh, I think, to really understand, uh, 
Bitcoin and I would say Bitcoin capital be the network, the mechanism, the functioning of, of Bitcoin. Um, you know, you read the white paper. Uh, there are books out there. Sefadeen Amos' book is great. Uh, you know, Jan, uh, Jan Pritzker has a great book as well called Inventing Bitcoin that explains these things. Um, so there's a high, there's a high let, moat to understanding how it actually works. Um, and when you do that research, then you can get a sense for what it could be, as opposed to just saying, okay, it's, you know, it's digital gold kind of thing, because gold is also limited in supply and Bitcoin's even more limited. Um, look, I think there is a world where, you know, in the future, all transactions of very large value do come across the Bitcoin network. And, um, you know, and it's possible that one day when the Federal Reserve wants to send $100 billion to the Bundesbank, they'll be able to do it in, you know, instantaneously for the cost of a dollar, right? And today, of course, it's a long convoluted process, um, you know, it takes who knows how long. Um, you know, there, there's also another world where you know, there are other blockchains that function, other cryptocurrencies that have different use cases that are also used. To me, Bitcoin is interesting because it's bulletproof security apparatus, right? It's something that's never been hacked, probably will never be hacked. Um, yes, I know it's slower. Yes, I know the technology, supposedly technologists say, you know, is not as good as, as other things. But that's not really what you need it for, right? I mean, I think that you're happy to wait for 6,000 confirmations if you're sending $100 billion. If you're, if you're buying a cup of coffee, it's mm -hmm. pointless to use Bitcoin. So um, I, I think, you know, the way that it turns energy from the analog world into security on the Internet, once people understand that, you know, what is that worth? I mean, to me, that's worth trillions and trillions of dollars. I, you know, my, my sort of first stop was this, you know, I've been saying for the last 18 months about this one trillion market value level. I think we sort of need to get comfortable at this level for a little while. Um, but, you know, eventually we could go up to three, four hundred thousand. And, you know, now that doesn't seem so far away. It seemed far away when we were talking at, you know, six, seven, eight, nine thousand. And there is a there is a world where it can, it can go up significantly more uh, than that. Um, and so, you know, this sort of digital asset ecosystem, Bitcoin can be that, as you mentioned before, that pristine collateral, that sort of triple a, you know, highest security uh, collateral for the new system. Um, and there can also be other blockchains out there that aren't as secure, um, but that have specific functions. Uh, and again, I'm not, you know, an expert on each of the specific protocols and how they function and which ones are better and where there's value. But, you know, there's certainly a world out there where everything of value, right? Not just ex extremely large value, but everything that you have that has value is on a blockchain somewhere. Um, and again, you know, you asked me, how did the two worlds morph a little bit? You have a perfect example of like the first inning of this when you have a, you know, a company like Paxos, for instance, building uh, PayPal, it's uh, on-ramp functionality, right? So uh, the 340 million people now that, you know, that use PayPal, they have access, they can buy Bitcoin and, and Ethereum uh, Paxos is a company that built them that gateway, you know, that platform into the digital asset world. So I think they're, you know, I'd use like bridge building or road building or it's on ramps, uh, railroad tracks being laid down. I think that's sort of what's starting to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah. one thing that people don't realize is that the distribution right, for investment products in crypto, if it's, you know, whether that's actually access to spot Bitcoin or derivatives or any other way that you can gain exposure has been severely limited, right? Like you haven't even been able to buy something like Bitcoin or gain exposure through your brokerage account other than GBTC, right? So yeah. Bitcoin hasn't had the advantage of having the pipes, right? The, the way that most people gain access to uh, investment products um, to benefit the extreme rise. Uh, in the price and adoption. So it really makes me super bullish to think about um, 
you know, what that's going to be like as that changes. But one thing I wanted to get your perspective on as well is just how do you think there are a lot of models that are being created? Um, like I know you're familiar with Plan B and kind of his stock to flow model. What do you think about um, do, you, do, you, are you, do you kind of subscribe to the idea that Bitcoin trades off of a, a supply demand kind of ratio, these four year cycles that we've seen that are kind of anchored around the happening? Or is it really trading on the debasement trade? Because, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw, but the Australian Central Bank um, implemented basically kind of a soft form of yield control. They bought a whole bunch of bonds at the long end. Um, and when they did that, global markets responded very quickly and Bitcoin hopped up like 12% in the course of uh, an hour or one day. Um, so I'm curious, do you think that Bitcoin right now is really following that kind of stock to flow supply schedule? Or do you think it's really trading kind of the debasement trade and it's really sensitive to interest rates? Yeah, I mean, I think it's both. And I think Bitcoin trades on more than just two drivers. I mean, there are probably 30 or 40 different drivers out there. Um, that's why I think Bitcoin, in terms of its price, and people say to me, you know, um, you know, is it correlated to the NASDAQ? Is it correlated to this? I think just Bitcoin and the entire digital asset ecosystem, it's doing its own thing. Mm. Uh, you know, in the last 10 years, it's up 250% annualized. Uh, it's the greatest performing asset in the history of the world. Uh, clearly, it's doing its own thing. It's not necessarily correlated with anything. Um, I think the post-COVID, you know, liquidity injections by the global central banks and fiscal authorities, I mean, obviously, that's been a big driver. But I don't ever attribute uh, one thing to like a day-to-day -day movement on Bitcoin. And maybe it was the Australian thing that popped at 12%, maybe not. Maybe mm -hmm. it just went down too much and then it popped back. You know, I'm not actively trading Bitcoin and I don't really suggest, unless you're doing it 24 seven and it's your full uh, time job, I don't really recommend trading it. I think it's, it's something where you need to hold have the can do the work, have the conviction, be a hodler, as they say, and um, and and just decide what percent you wanted of your portfolio, and then come back in five, six, seven years. Yeah, what do you think about the relation to uh, between Bitcoin and gold? Um, do you think you know Bitcoin's obviously been doing very well over the course of the last couple of months? Gold has been doing. Um, you know, a little bit less well. I know that you're a big. Less well, gold's been doing poorly and mm -hmm. much worse than I had anticipated. Um, that being said, I mean, gold is also a thing that, you know, over the 25 years I've traded it, you know, gold never does what you want it to do when you want it to do it. And, I, you know, I've lived through this many, many times. Gold is very exasperating. Um, you know, you have to trade it in a way or invest in it in a way the same way that you do in Bitcoin. Uh, you you have to have it as a percentage of your portfolio. I think it's a great hedge for the uh, for the traditional assets, um, especially with bonds yielding less than one percent. Uh, you know, two years yielding nothing and negative yields everywhere. I think if you're if you have a traditional 60-40 portfolio, and I've said this many times before, from 1981 till now, you've done great. Every time we've had a wobble in the equity market, you've had bonds uh, to offset. Uh, with yield and capital appreciation. And now I think that's over. And so you have $190 trillion of cash plus cash plus duration. So bonds in the world that really aren't going to be a great hedge if we have a serious slowdown um, or, again, another equity wobble based on whatever it is. And so in that scenario, I think you have to think that uh, the authorities, again, come in and add tremendous liquidity and that ends up being very bullish for gold. Uh, gold can go up 20, 30, 40%. And bonds, I don't really think have that ability. So for me, gold is an excellent hedge and for institutions as well in their portfolio. Maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10%. Um, I know for an institutional portfolio that I help oversee, I feel much more comfortable with the equity portion of the portfolio because we have a gold position. So I can run more risk on the equity side because I feel like if I really am in trouble, the gold will help bail me out in a sense, will act as a hedge. And Bitcoin to me, 
I think it's just something much bigger. It's like the root of an entire new system. It's a right. whole new world. So it's it's a lot bigger than just a hedge for the existing system. Um, also, look, I, I don't, you know, I, I think that the Fed and the, you know, the U.S. Treasury, they will continue to stimulate uh, until the dollar really goes down. I mean, the dollar is still at a pretty high level, generally speaking. Uh, it started its depreciation in March. Uh, that was sort of the peak of the dollar. And my view has been since March, really, that we're going to have a gentle depreciation. It could it could weaken, you know, look, people forget the euro in 2000 was at 80 and uh, the euro went from 80 to 160 um, by, you know, early 08. And so euro doubled. Now, I'm not saying the euro is going to double here. It's at 120. Um, and I use that just as a proxy for non-dollar currency. Again, all the central banks, everyone is stimulating but the dollar really is still the world's reserve currency. And given the amount of liquidity the Fed is adding and M2, the fact that M2 is up 25% on a year over year basis, and it's never been above 10 per, I mean, it's been between zero and 10% for 40 years. And there's been a massive breakout. I mean, M1 is up over 60%. Uh, again, those aren't great metrics, but they are metrics that suggest that there is a massive amount of liquidity sitting out there. And that's dollar liquidity. And so I think that the dollar uh, should be, you know, should be in a, I don't think it's a dramatic bear market. My point about getting into this about the dollar is that the dollar can weaken. Uh, and as long as it weakens in a sort of soft trend way, it can be a net positive, you know, for growth and for all sorts of things. And it's only when the dollar has a rapid depreciation uh, you know, let's say something like 30% in one month, is would there be a fear that the stimulus is too much? So people say like, oh, how much stimulus can, can we do? How much liquidity can we add? I think we can add as much liquidity as we need to as long as the dollar sell-off is still a trend sell-off and doesn't become this, uh, you know, this rapid panicked affair. And that would be a sense that people were losing confidence in the dollar. I don't see that we're anywhere near that, yeah. right? So that also makes me positive on gold generally, because as the dollar weakens, gold will also be supported. Yeah. You, you know, you kind of hear guys like um, Ray Dalio or Paul Singer use this metaphor to describe the economy as basically being a machine, right? And there are kind of these interconnections and, thing, and levers that you can pull to kind of make the economy do what you want. But it seems like what's been happening with central banks is that they've been uh, yanking on the same lever for such a long period of time that eventually, if you, if you think about almost like a factory and it's filled with a whole bunch of machines, there's stuff that's just starting to break, right? And there's stuff that is just clearly not, not working. Is the eventual breakage that happens, does that happen with a, a devaluation of the dollar or are there other kind of macro things to be aware of um, that's... that's well Look, the, the authorities haven't let anyone default, basically. So and we know they're in there buying uh, treasuries. And so we probably, you know, if those guys are going to be right, I mean, I don't have such a cataclysmic view. You know, I think they might be missing a little bit this this new world, this new digital asset ecosystem. I think, um, you know, tremendous liquidity has been going uh, into this world. I mean, just think. Nine months ago, Coinbase was seven billion dollars valuation. Now it's fifty or a hundred, and Bitcoin was one hundred and fifty billion, and now it's a trillion. But I think that if you were going to look, you know, if there's one thing that you should look at to get nervous, is it's as I said, it would be a rapid, um, a rapid depreciation of the dollar over a very short period of time. That would tell you that there was a problem out there. Uh, that was sort of spinning out of control. Um, so for me, it's just it, that it's it's that simple. I don't think you're going to see uh, default. Uh, you know, we are sort of following that Japanese model. You know, at some point, look. You know, with you've got 15 trillion dollars of negative yielding debt. That's sort of a sign that there is something weird. That there's something broken right. out there because that's not that's not a, a natural. Uh, that, that's uh, that's not a healthy development. But that being said, 
Japan has had negative to zero yields for a long time. And, you know, they haven't seen a lot of growth, but, you know, their culture keeps on functioning and there is some level of growth. And I'm not saying that's where we're going. I'm just saying that, you know, we've been in this sort of slow, and I don't even want to say slow growth, but a slow transition to something else, right? And I think that something else is this whole new digital world and there's tremendous wealth being created there now there's a whole new world growing up there it has its own art scene it has its own yeah. gaming world it has its own social world um you know the average age is probably you know 35 or whatever it is but this to me is a much bigger cultural uh you know cultural almost civilizational change it's a transition away from you know, 20th century frameworks to sort of this new digital world. And Peter Thiel gave a very good interview recently. It was about, you know, the difference between Silicon Valley and breaking the existing hold of, of power that the coasts have had, uh, you know, uh, the, the old 20th century framework. Right. Um, and, and I mean, those guys both say it better than I do. And that's why I say it's the most exciting period because there's like a whole brand new exciting future out there. You just have to do the work, you know, to figure it out, to get in there. And there are massive opportunities, yeah. massive opportunities for creativity, for building wealth, building businesses, for, you know, communities to build. So it's, yeah, it's, it's exciting stuff. It's, it's, it's really a story of growth. I think, uh, I mean, you, you did say this word before, but productivity has been stunted in many developed countries, uh, kind of productive growth in the way that economic economists define it for a long period of time. And, uh, you know, I listened to this great talk about how crypto uh, or digital assets is one of the true disruptive um, new industries in the classical Clay Christensen sense of being disruptive, because it's kind of this weird little pocket uh, you know, it served a really small audience in the beginning, which were these kind of libertarian people who didn't like, um, you know, central banks controlling the money supply and all that kind of stuff. But what's happening right now is that it's just an entirely new paradigm and it's really a story about growth. And, you know, one tidbit, um, there's a guy, James Aitken, who on, uh, on a recent podcast, he was describing two of his early clients. He runs a research shop and they were two macro guys, two very famous macro guys who had made their career uh, probably around the same time that you were making it. And he said that these guys uh, made more money uh, in crypto than they made in their entire macro careers before this, which to me was just a fascinating tidbit of information. Yeah. Well, it's not just growth of money. I mean, it's growth. It's it's actual, you know, GDP equivalent growth. Right. Right. I mean, every every major company in the space is hiring and they're not hiring like 10 or 20 people. It's hundreds and thousands of people. So I, you know, in that very first interview I did with Raul on Bitcoin in summer of 2019, I sort of posited this idea that, you know, people talked about, oh, governments are going to ban Bitcoin. Well, I mean, I see it as a tremendous growth area and governments in fact, should be incentivizing crypto Bitcoin companies, you know, to grow here. And I think it'll be, you know, within five, 10 years, it's going to be a huge jobs generator. Yeah. And so once legislators uh, who don't understand this stuff yet, once they see that it has the power to create jobs and to build wealth and change people's lives, I think, you know, they'll have more interest. And I, I think that's coming, right? That's how you know we're still early in it because, um, you know, they, they don't quite see that yet. Yeah. They don't quite see that yet. So the, you're right about, about that growth. Um, also in productivity, and I, I think maybe we mentioned this or maybe I talked to you about this before or not, but even something as simple as Zoom, you know, the productivity gains from uh, uh, you know, from Zoom are, I think, massive and and not yet measured. I mean, I'll just give you an example, um, you know, in speaking with investors, 
Um, we had a whole bunch of investors in Australia. I couldn't get down there to meet them. I ended up doing, you know, a Zoom call with 15 to 20 of them. And, you know, the next day, you know, we had an allocation. And the point is that I didn't have to go there for two weeks. I didn't have to meet, uh, you know, lunch and dinner. I didn't have to, you know, take the flight, spend money on the hotels and the meals. And, you know, it probably saved me, you know, $50,000 or something. Right. And so all of that, versus just one or two hours on Zoom. And so it's a change in mentality. You know, people, the fact that they feel comfortable allocating capital uh, on a Zoom is just a massive, massive change. I mean, I, you know, you used to have to like take the flight to Geneva and talk to 50 guys and maybe two thought you were okay. And, you know, thankfully I, I only, you know, raised money, uh, well, once really, um, and, and didn't have to do all of that. But I've actually found the process of being involved in that um, now, post COVID, is you know not taxing and and actually quite fun in some cases. So, like that's just one little example of how sort of the new world is evolving, right? And as as time goes on, and the the the, the kids are twenty or you know, the 30 year olds as they sort of move up the ladder, I think the world is just increasingly gonna move this way to everything being streamlined. So you're talking about like trillions and trillions of dollars of, of wealth that's being created by this productivity boom. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's put some kind of guidelines um, or just be a little bit more specific about what we mean this kind of new world because i can already kind of hear some people saying oh yeah that's i've heard this before new world right around times when things get really frothy but i think you and me are both big believers that digital assets represent a huge paradigm shift so what are some of the core tenants when you look at this space like what gets you excited that hey there's really a huge innovation here this looks really different than it did kind of in the old world or the old financial system well, I mean, look, just as an example, you have a whole new form of collateral that's just grown up. I mean, right. almost out of nowhere. And people are now comfortable borrowing and lending those assets. So, you know, stable coins, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, you know, they all have a, I don't want to say, a, um, you know, the, the interest rates that are being attached to them. I think that's a fascinating new development. And there's some, you know, there's, of course, decentralized version of that, but there's also, you know, a centralized version. You've got Celsius and Compound and BlockFi. Um, and, you know, I, I think just as an example, if you told people, look, you've got your dollars in a bank and it's yielding zero, but you yeah. can take your dollars and you can move them over to this digital asset world and you can, you know, have a dollar uh, stable coin and you can then lend that stable coin and make four, five, six percent. I think a lot of people would do that. Uh, of course, there are risks there and it's not guaranteed in the way it might be in the banks. But you're looking at, you know, trillions of dollars sitting at zero. And we have a real problem here in the insurance uh, industry and other businesses that have been that have relied on yield for years and years. And I think the German insurance industry, again, negative yields. And I think that they're being forced to still invest the capital into negative yields and the government is subsidizing them. So, you know, you have a whole world over here that's capital starved and people are willing to, you know, pay those kinds of interest rates. And so I think it's in the very first inning. And what could that look like? I think the guys at Nidig somewhere somewhere i read we're talking about you know bitcoin based insurance products like yeah. that you know how do we move from one world to the other i mean maybe that's a way maybe people realize that they can offer better products because they're investing a little bit in bitcoin and so i i just you know i i think that they're moved by corporates you know michael sailors move into bitcoin i think that's great um I don't think U.S. corporations are the most um, 
you know, risk taking guys. And I, again, I don't think there's that much risk inherent in Bitcoin, even though there's volatility. Um, but, you know, you really need the asset allocators, the investors to come to Bitcoin. To me, you know, that's sort of the next the next whoosh. And I know, you know, always hear, oh, every guy has it in his personal account. Um, but, you know, he won't have it in his fund or he won't have it in, you know, the, the insurance company won't have it. I mean, Massachusetts Mutual, that purchase was huge. I think maybe the most important purchase of the entire year last yeah. year. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, those are just two examples. Uh, you, you know, all sorts of, you know, the dis displacement of the entire fixed income world with a Bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh, yielding asset. I mean, that could happen. I mean, I, I don't, I just think people aren't aware that it's out there. So that's just one, you know, one example. Yeah. And um, I totally agree with you that the, the asset allocators kind of moving into Bitcoin, that's the next big step. I know you're kind of doing your part with uh, 10T holdings. So I'd like to actually transition. If you could just give us a, a description of what 10T is and, and what led you to start it. Yeah, um, we're investing in uh, 10 to 15 companies uh, in this digital asset ecosystem. Again, over $400 million in, in market value. We think that's sort of the threshold line uh, between a company that's sort of still trying to figure out where it wants to go and a company that sort of established itself and you know has built a moat around its business, uh, is already producing revenue. Um, is already established enough so that its business really isn't at risk. I'm not, I'm not a venture capitalist. Uh, I'm not, not focused on the micro. It's also a different type of risk profile when you look at, at mid to late stage companies. And I think we are the first fund that explicitly focuses on these mid to late stage companies in the digital asset ecosystem. And we've broken this world into three sectors, uh, digital asset ecosystem gateways, next generation financial services and blockchain infrastructure. And we're going to have three to five of the leading companies in each sector uh, in the portfolio. And we've already purchased two uh, that we're very happy with. And, you know, that's our, you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm out there looking to hire research analysts. So uh, anyone watching this, I'm, uh, if you're, if you're interested, shoot me, uh, shoot me an email. Um, we uh, we have a, a, a budding team um, right now. I think in total we're about ten people. So we're in a very good spot. There's been tremendous interest, and um, I think for the moment we're alone in this area. The capital stack, in a sense that I mean, the only ones who are focusing explicitly on this area of the capital stack uh, in this area. There are growth equity uh, investors who will write one-off checks to the space. And, you know, they're the big names like Tiger and KOTU. Um, but uh, in terms of this being our only focus, I think we're the only ones right now. But I suspect others will come into the space. Yeah, absolutely. And in addition to kind of being a, a necessary place in the capital stack, I think one of the other things that 10T does really well is it allows more investors that might not be comfortable holding the spot asset to still gain exposure to the space, right? Yeah. So, Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's, you know, in a way in the old world, you'd call it a picks and shovels strategy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a diversified portfolio uh, of companies. These are private companies, the income statement balance sheet. Most people from the traditional world can look at this and sort of understand what it is. If I say to a, you know, a 65 year old guy, you know, if I even say proof of work algorithm, you know, or Ethereum, I mean, it's over. He, well, I've lost him. And what about NFTs? It's kind of weird, um, but I've got one foot in this old world and one foot in this new world. And I kind of have a good sense for what people in the old world understand and how to, uh, how to structure and describe uh, you know, what's going on in, in, in the new world in, in terms that they understand. Uh, and it's not that they're not intelligent or not successful. It's just that it's a tremendous leap and, you know, they need help. Um, yeah. 
you know, as I myself need help from people in the in the new world on certain things. You know, I think there's certain things that are very complex. It is a complementary uh, exposure, uh, but it's also, you know, I think an easier easier bet for the old guys to make. Right. Yeah. Um, kind of in a way, in the way that they can wrap their minds around it because these are companies and they're producing revenues and profits and all that kind of stuff. But also I've heard you describe, you know, the run-ups in Bitcoin uh, and crypto in general tend to be accompanied by huge crashes afterwards, right? Like, you know, 80% top to bottom type crashes and yeah. the volatility in companies in this space um, is obviously correlated to that, but the extreme volatility is a little bit less. No, it, it, it's not as it's not as correlated on the downside as you think. I mean, when Bitcoin went down 80% uh, in 18, um, a basket of the more developed companies, you know, held its value relatively well. Mm. Um, so and also, you know, there isn't there isn't a daily or weekly or monthly mark to market, right? It's right. a different it's a different game you're playing. And that's sort of, I think, the game you need to play in this space. You cannot have a six month or one year or even two year view. This is uh, um, really you're going to get the most out of your investment uh, on a five, six, seven, eight year view. And um, so that's why I've structured my investment this way, because I do think Bitcoin will have another 80 percent drawdown or 70 percent or wh whatever it is. And whether it's from 200,000 back down to 50 or whatever, I don't know. Um, and a lot of people, most people are very uncomfortable with that. And so we sort of, it's not a, I wouldn't call it a backdoor way, but it's just a different way to get exposure. And I'm not saying we're gonna outperform or underperform Bitcoin. All I know is that there's this big digital uh, asset ecosystem that is growing and there's tremendous wind at your back from the macro fundamentals. And I just want to, you know, be in an investment that has that wind at its back. And I don't need to make the venture capital returns. Guys are, I always say the venture capitalist is buying the stock at one. And then he's selling it to us at 100 because we think it's going to 1,000 or 2,000. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't need to make the 100x. Um, you know, there are plenty of you guys a lot smarter than me who are doing that. Um, we just want to build a, a nice macro bet that's a bet on the sector and that, um, you know, has also, we think, a high probability uh, of winning. So the risk reward uh, of the of the investment is also different. Yeah. So kind of going full circle here in the beginning of this interview, we talked about your experience at Tiger um, and how a guy like Julian Robertson just developed incredible conviction and that allowed him to hold through incredible volatility, right? Hopefully, usually on the upside, but also on the downside as well. And I think one of the big challenges in crypto, if you, especially if you zoom out and look over multiple cycles, it's just, it seems like it's the ability to hold through intense volatility, right? Um, and not try to trade in and around different cycles and stuff like that. So do you think that your experience at Tiger and just your experience in general with, um, you know, Michael Steinhardt or Stanley Druckenmiller is what gave you the conviction to hold uh, throughout some of these periods of intense volatility? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I've always had more of an investment, uh, you know, uh, outlook. Um, I've never, never really been interested in like trading the squiggles in markets based on like nuance or, uh, you know, or trading off data or what, what, whatever it is. I've always been focused on these broader, bigger macro trends. Um, I, I, it was the same thing with the agricultural, the farmland REIT that I started with Stan called AgCoa that we held for seven years. The same thing with the physical gold business, GBI, Gold Bullion International that I started in 09 that, you know, after uh, 11 years is, you know, is thriving right now holding for these longer periods of time because you get the accrual as well. You know, mm -hmm. the accrual of value that is not uh, taxed, right? If you make some big gains trading, you pay, if it's not capital gains, you pay short-term capital gains, which, um, you know, I, I think the goal really uh, in accumulating wealth is, is to pay the long-term capital gains rate. And I think it should be a lower rate because you know, you're, you're, you're building a business, 
you're sticking with it, you're employing people, you're really, you know, benefiting the economy and just trading the squiggles for, you know, some investors uh, to make return on a short term basis. Just it's just less interesting to me. I mean, there are guys who are phenomenal at it and, you know, that's what they do. And that's a great business for them. But the way that you can do that, the only way I can do it is is by doing a tremendous amount, as I said before, of research, digging in, knowing, you know, knowing as much as you can uh, and staying on top of your theme and thesis. I don't want to say 24 seven, but, you know, certainly, you know, constantly. And it's so not a nine to five. <laughs> what's yeah, it's no, not it's nine not to nine to five, to five um, but you, you know, you can still live. It's a very nice, a very nice life. You just mm -hmm. have a, a different type of schedule. You know, I, you know, sometimes you work less during the week and maybe more on the weekend. Sometimes you work less during the day and more in the evening. Um, you know, you make your own, you make your own schedule. Uh, the only thing that's important really are results. And, um, you know, you, you do your research and you, you get your, your, your mind around the idea on your own time, you know, on your own time frame. It's not a, it's definitely not that old 20th century model of, you know, commute for an hour, work nine to five, commute back and, you know, chew yourself up into dust, right? I mean, that's, no. uh, I think that's gonna go away. Yeah. Uh, younger people just don't wanna live that way. No, people, people care about flexibility, I would say these days. That's a big consideration for where you want to work. Yeah. And you, you can be more creative also because you're not battling the physical grind. And so your mind opens up. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think people have figured that out during COVID. I mean, you talked about zoom and all the productivity gains that are going to come from that. I think a lot of people figured out when everyone had to go home that, Hey, the world is still turning, you know, uh, that productivity on an office. I know JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon said something about, Hey, we're worried about productivity, but if you're not a big regulated bank, you know, in our company, I think people have even gotten more productive because like you said, people don't have to travel into the office and waste a whole bunch of time commuting. And look, and you can hire people from all over the place. I mean, 10 T is very decentralized. You know, we have someone uh, in LA, we have another person in Alaska, someone else in Zurich. Uh, you know, I'm in Greenwich. We have someone in New York, just hired somebody in Colorado. So, you know, and everything seems to be working just fine uh, so far. I mean, sometimes I wish I, we had more uh, communication, but everyone's adjusting uh, well. So, yeah, I agree with that. Great. Yeah. Well, Dan, you've already been uh, really generous with your time. Uh, if people are interested in finding out more about you or Tenti Holdings, or if there are any would-be analysts uh, on the call and want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Well, you send me uh, an email. Uh, you know, I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, that's an easy way. Or uh, on Twitter, of course, uh, DTAPCAP uh, is my is my Twitter handle. But um, we have a landing page that you can look at. There's not a lot of information there uh, because we aren't marketing to people. But we, we do have a landing page uh, that at least, you know, shows you who we are and some some interesting uh, panels on that uh, on that landing page. Um, but no, thanks. It's been great chatting. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate it because, uh, of all the work that went in beforehand <laughs> on yeah, the reconfiguring. Yeah, I know this, that's, uh, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the most anyone's probably ever made you work for an interview. So we, we, we appreciate right. the time. It's all right. It's all good. <laughs> okay. All, all right, right Dan, thanks, Michael. this has been a ton of fun. We'll have to do it again soon. Great. All right. Bye.